Hello and welcome to my today's lesson on chemistry. I'm your regular host, Mr. Philip Maman. I hope you've enjoyed my series that I have done before now, and I'm sure today you will have an exciting time listening to this lesson. Today, I'll be looking at a very important topic, and it is critical at this point that you're preparing to write your SSC exams. It's a requirement in your SSC exams that you carry out paper three, chemistry paper three. Chemistry paper three is purely chemistry practical. And on that paper, you are going to do quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis. Today, I'll be discussing quantitative analysis. And in quantitative analysis, we'll be taking a good look at titration. I would like us to proceed today as we look at our lesson and uh, you will see how you can carry out quantitative analysis. Follow me and you will know what we are going to discuss today. And I'm, glad, I'm sure you'll be glad you did. In today's lesson, We'll be looking at the learning outcome as follows. At the end of the lesson, students should be able to define titration, list and state the use of apparatus and materials, manipulate the apparatus, present the table of values, and define concentration terms. Obviously, after this, you should be able to carry out calculations that follow up in your questions. Like I said earlier on, the very interesting part of chemistry, very, very critical at this time. And as we proceed, I will sure you will enjoy the lesson. Now, if two substances will add completely and very fast with each other, we can use a solution of known concentration to determine the concentration the of unknown of order. The process by which this is carried out is called titration. So you can use the concentration of a known solution to determine the concentration of unknown solution. This can be carried out through standardization. It consists of the gradual addition of one solution until sufficient volume of the burial solution has been added, completely reacts with the measured quantity of the second reactor until the end point is established. Now, what is end point? End point is the point where there is just a color change during an acid-base titration. There are two types of titration we'll be considering at this level, but for the scope of this lesson, we'll be looking at acid-base titration and redox titration. What did I say? I said acid-based titration and redox titration. Earlier, I've said end point is the point where there's just a color change during an acid-based titration. The color change is indicated by the use of an indicator. I'm sure that some of you are already asking, what is an indicator? What's an indicator? When you go to laboratory, you must have come across maybe methyl orange, phenolphthalein, litmus paper. They are all indicator. An indicator is a weak organic acid or base that changes color with a change in pH. Some common indicators include your methyl orange. If you look at the range of your methyl orange, you see that it is within 3.1 to 4.4. Now, when you put methyl orange in uh, an acidic medium, the color is usually red or pink. Now, it's depending on who is looking at the color. Actually, it's usually pink. And when you put it in a basic medium, it's usually yellow in color. But when neutral, metal orange is orange in color, as the name implies. What about phenaphthalene? Phenaphthalene has a pH of 5.0 to 8.0. It is colorless in an acidic medium. It is pink or red in basic medium. And of course, it is colorless when neutral. And that's why a phenaphthalene indicator cannot be used to differentiate between a neutral substance and a acidic substance because we get the same coloration. Now, what about litmus paper? Now, litmus paper come either as red or blue. Now, the red litmus paper is used to test for a base because it will turn from red to blue in a basic medium. It will turn from red to blue in a basic medium. But in an acidic medium, we use the blue litmus paper. When you insert a blue litmus paper in an acid, it will turn from blue to red. This is how you can use these indicators to test whether a substance is acidic, whether a substance is basic, or whether a substance is neutral. Now, choice of indicator. How do we choose indicators for acid-based titration? Now, the choice of indicator for acid-based titration is usually based on the strength of the acid and base. For a strong acid, but it's a strong base titration, any indicator mentioned above is suitable. For a strong acid or strong base titration, any indication as mentioned above is suitable. But when you are titrating a weak acid versus a strong base, what's an example of a weak acid? 
if tannoic acid is a weak acid, when you're titrating it against a strong base like potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide, you can use phenaphthalene indicator. And I'm sure you can marry that with the uh, pH range of uh, phenaphthalene indicator. Now, what about when you're titrating a strong acid, but it's a sweet base? You can use metal orange as an indicator. So you can see that the choice of indicator is married to the pH range of the indicator. And finally, weak acid versus weak base does not have a suitable uh, indicator at this level. Now, the next thing we'll be talking about is a standard solution. Students always uh, ask questions on what is a standard solution. Today, you will follow me and you know what a standard solution is. A standard solution is any solution whose concentration is known. In other words, a standard solution is a solution of known concentration. When a substance is available in pure state, a solution of definite concentration is prepared by weighing out a calculated amount of substance, dissolve it in a solvent, and making the solution to the volume in the volumetric flask. Yes, volumetric flask. Shortly, we see what a volumetric flask is, and volumetric flask is used to prepare a standard solution. Now, volumetric flask comes in different volumes, but the most acceptable one is the 1 gm cube, 1,000 centimeter cube volumetric flask. Now, such a solution is called a primary standard. What is a primary standard? It's when a substance is available in pure state and a solution of definite concentration is prepared by weighing out a calculated amount of the substance and dissolving it in a solvent and making up the solution to the volume in a volumetric flask. That's an example of a standard solution. Uh, example of a primary standard is sodium trioxocarbonate 4, benzoic acid, or benzoic acid, these are examples of a primary standard. A good primary standard must satisfy the following condition. One, it must be easy to obtain, purify, dry, and preserve in pure state. One, it must be easy to obtain, purify, dry, and preserve in pure state. It must not be altered during weighing. You know that some substances, when you want to weigh them, they can either absorb moisture, as in the case of the liquid of hygroscopic, or they can lose water or crystallization, as the case of a fluorescent. So a, a, a good primary standard must not be the liquid a fluorescent, or hygroscopic. It must maintain its composition, meaning that the composition will not change when it's exposed to the atmosphere. The total amount of impurity must be small. That means ranging from 0.01 to 0.02 percent. That's a primary standard, a good primary standard. It should have a molar mass so that the weighing error will be negligible. Number six, it should be readily soluble under the experimental condition. And number seven, its reaction should be stoichiometric and practically instantaneous. Note that the primary standard is difficult to obtain. It's difficult to obtain a primary standard but you can as well standardize standards. Like I said earlier on, we're going to come across some apparatus that you use during your acid-based titration. The first one is your prepared. You can see number one is your prepared. I'm sure that in our classrooms or our laboratory, you will not have a suction bulb prepared. You have a pipette that you suck with your mouth. It is an apparatus that works with pressure. Usually you have 25 or 20 centimeter cube pipette in your laboratory for this exam. You must ensure that the pipette is uniform throughout the experiment, throughout the class, that every member of the class must have the same volume of pipette because your grading will be based on the list or the submission made by your teacher of the volume of your pipette. So ensure that you have the same pipette as your teacher Ensure that every other person in the lab that is performing this experiment is using the same volume of pipette. Very, very important. Number two is your beaker. Your beaker can be of different sizes. Usually your beaker is used to carry your acid and your base. Then the number three is your burette. Yes, do you hear me say burette? Of course, it's burette. You can see your burette. Your burette is used to hold your acid or your oxidizing agent when it is uh, acid, uh, redox titration. But when it is acid-based titration, it is used to hold your acid. Then you have your conical flux, where you measure your base using your pipette and transfer into the conical flux. The conical flux holds your base, and it is used to titrate against the acid in the burette. Again, I said your conical flux is used to hold your base 
or your reducing agent and you add your indicator, then you titrate against your acid in the buret. So the buret is used to hold the acid while the conical flask is used to hold the base. Number five is your volumetric flask. Yes, I mentioned volumetric flask earlier. What did I say it's used for? It's used to prepare a standard solution. There are different volume of volumetric flask, but the most important one or the most used one, frequently used one to prepare a standard solution is a one DM cube or 1000 centimeter cube volumetric flask. Obviously you have seen number six as your measuring cylinder. It is used to measure accurately certain liquid in the laboratory. My wonderful student, it's important that you know this apparatus, not here yet, but you will see that we have what we call a retos tank. The retos tank is used to hold your burette. So you can see your burette clamped to a retos tank and you can see your conical flask. So you can see your retos tank number one, Number two is your conical flask containing uh, a base without an indicator. The number three is your conical flask with an indicator. And the indicator here obviously is your metal orange. How do I know it's metal orange? Because the color is yellow. And metal orange turns a base to yellow coloration. Now, when you start adding your acid to the base in the conical flask, the color begin to change. As you can see, the color is changing. Now the color will change to number four, as you can see. And when it gets to number five, that is your end point. At that point, the acid has neutralized the base. Remember I said your end point is the point where there's just a color change during an acid-base titration. Once again, you have your retos tank, which is clamped, uh, which the buret is clamped to. Then you have your tap, that used to move or to release your acid into the conical flask, as you can see there. Then of course, you have your number three, which is your conical flask containing your yellow base, which has an indicator. Uh, I said is metal orange because metal orange turns a base to yellow color. Then the different stages of the titration. Obviously number five is the point where the color has changed. Now this experiment or these procedures are the same for both acid-based titration and for redox titration. Now, the difference lies in the color at the beginning of the titration and at the end of the titration. You must know that there's a color change at the end point. My wonderful student, haven't done this, our acid-based titration, you have your acid, you have your base, you have your indicator, and you have your distilled water. Now, what do you use your distilled water for? Your distilled water is used to wash your apparatus. Before you start any experiment, there are precautions that you must take note of. These are things that you do to minimize error. In this case, all your glasswares must be washed, rinsed with distilled water, and dry. Remember, I have told you before that when you're writing your precautions, they should be in reported speech because the examiner will not be there when you're carrying out your experiment. So you can have it in this way. You can say it was ensured that the glasswares, all the glasswares were washed, rinsed with distilled water and dry. You can listen to what I have said. It is in reported speech. I'll take it again. It was ensured that all the glasswares were washed, rinsed with distilled water and dry. You can have as many precautions as possible. As we move up discussion today, I'll point out some of these precautions that you need to know. My wonderful students, the next titration is redox titration. In the case of redox titration, you don't have acid and base. You have what we call oxidizing agent and reducing agent. Of course, you have your distilled water as well as your indicator. Remember I pointed out earlier on, distilled water is used to wash your glasswares, your apparatus, of course, your indicator is used to get a color change during this titration. Now, after you have done this, during your presentation, of course, you will set your size of or volume of pipette. Your volume of pipettes is usually the same as your volume of base. So if you ask, what is your volume of base? In this case, I said 25.00 centimeter cube. Your, your pipette might be 20 centimeter cube. If it is, then that is your volume of pipette. Here, our indicator use is metal orange. It's not usually the same for us experiment. I'm sure you will take note of it. And this is your presentation of values. Your presentation of value is such that you must know that your units are very, very important. So let's look at our buret readings. 
Our visual reading, we have the rough reading, the first reading, the second reading, and obviously the third reading. Now, your final burette reading is the point where there is just the color change. You pick the reading from your burette and you record it. As you can see, this experiment was carried out four times, having the rough, the first, the second, and the third reading. Now, your initial reading is the point where the acid is before the titration started. Most cases, it's usually at 0.00. We can see it for the first reading, 0.00. Second reading, 0.00. Third reading, you change from 0.00. You want to start from 10.00. That's where your acid stop at. Why did I introduce this? To let you know that it is always compulsory to start from 0.00. You can start from a point where you have sufficient acid or sufficient oxidizing agent to reduce, to, 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 to neutralize the oxidizing agent or to neutralize the base as the case might be. Your final volume of acid use is usually gotten from uh, your final burette reading, subtracting your initial burette reading. As in this case, 27.80 minus 0 0.00, 26.40 minus 0 0.00, uh, 25.00 minus 0 0.00, and 36.70 minus 10.00. So if you look at the table, you see that the arithmetical uh, subtraction has been done. Always take note that you don't have arithmetical errors because they will reduce your, your, your scores during this experiment. Let me also draw your attention to what we call concordant values. Concordant values is very, very important when you're carrying out your average volume of acid use or average title value. Now, for the table above, there are varieties of options you can use to get your average title based on the concordant values using the difference of 0 0.2 plus or minus. The difference between your reading should not be more than 0 0.2. Now, if you go back to the table, you find out that the difference between the first reading, which is 26.40 and 26.50 is 0 0.1. So these two values are concordant values. Now take a look at 26.40, which is the first reading, and 26.70. Uh, the difference between them is wide. That's 0 0.30, uh, which is above uh, the uh, minimum or the maximum given as the case might be. So let's be careful to ensure that we have concordant values. Why did I say concordant values are? I say that they are values that are close together, whose difference is not more than 0 0.30. Now, if we proceed further, you find out that we have first option, rough reading plus third reading divided by two. The second option we have as concordant value is first reading plus second reading divided by two. And the third option we have is second reading plus third reading divided by two. Note that you can have three values being concordant values. If you have three values, you have to be divided by three. You're looking for the average. If the table has three concordant values, then it is it will be divided by three. Now, what, based on what we have, we are taking uh, first reading plus second reading divided by two, and our average is 26.45 centimeter cube. I know that if you take care in doing this, you have your maximum mark for your table and for your titration. My wonderful student, what is the aim of carrying out titration? When you carry out titration, you're supposed to carry out calculations either to determine concentration times in terms of number of mole of acid, number of mole of base, concentration of acid, concentration of base, volume of acid, or volume of base. So if you are to carry out these uh, calculations, you will follow this procedure using concentration times. Now, what is concentration? There are two types of concentration, molar concentration and mass concentration. Now, when you say molar concentration, this is the amount in mole of a substance dissolved in one dm cube or 1,000 centimeter cube of solution. Again, this is the amount in mole of a substance dissolved in one dm cube or 1,000 centimeter cube of a solution. Molar concentration in mole per dm cube can be calculated using a formula, amount in moles over volume in centimeter cube multiplied by 1,000. Why are we multiplying by 1,000? To convert from cm cube to dm cube to convert from centimeter cube to decimeter cube. So if you have already converted your volume to decimeter cube, your formula will be amount in mole 
all over volume in density in Q. I want us to understand, I said again, amount in moles all over volume in decimeter cube. Now, what about mass concentration? What is mass concentration? This is the mass of a substance in grams dissolved in one dm cube or 1,000 centimeter cube of solution. Again, this is the mass in gram of a substance dissolved in one dm cube or 1,000 centimeter cube of solution. Mass concentration is calculated using the formula mass in grams over volume in centimeter cube multiplied by 1,000 or mass in grams over volume in decimeter cube. Remember I said earlier, the essence of multiplying by 1,000 is to convert from centimeter cube to decimeter cube. So if you have converted from centimeter cube to decimeter cube, there is no need to multiply by 1,000. Now there's a formula that connects mass concentration in grams per gm cube, molar concentration in mole per gm cube, and molar mass. And the formula is mass concentration in grams per gm cube is equal to molar concentration in mole per gm cube multiplied by molar mass. I'm sure that my students are good chemistry students. You can walk around this formula and make any of these parameters the subject of the formula, and you'll be able to get the order that is unknown. So far, so good. We have had quite a lot on this discussion. Now, there's a formula we call the national anthem in chemistry. Every chemistry student is supposed to be familiar with this question or with this formula. Uh, it shows the relationship between concentration, number of mole, and volume. Concentration is directly proportional to number of mole, but inversely proportional to volume, meaning that the more the volume of, uh, uh, of water, the less the concentration of the solute, or the more the volume of the solvent, the less the concentration of the solute. So we're going to see it. The formula says CA, VA over CB, VB is equal to NA over NB, where CA is the concentration of acid, in mole per dm cube, CB is the concentration of base in mole per dm cube, VA is the volume of acid in centimeter cube, and VB is the volume of base in centimeter cube. Remember, NA is number of mole of acid, and NB is the number of mole of base. Now, when you're not doing acid base titration and you are doing redox reaction, the formula will read CA, VA, sorry, COA, which is C. Um, oxidizing agent, VOA, V oxidizing agent, all over CRA, and VRA is equal to NOA over NOB. Now, if you are defining the terms, we say concentration of oxidizing agent times volume of oxidizing agent, all over concentration of reducing agent times volume of reducing agent is equal to number of mole of oxidizing agent all over a number of mode of reducing agent. As you can see, where COA means concentration of oxidizing agent, CRA means concentration of reducing agent, VOA is volume of oxidizing agent, and VRA is volume of reducing agent. Number of mole of NOA is number of mole of oxidizing agent, NRA is number of mole of reducing agent. I'll give you a typical example. You can see a thiosulfate plus iodine. And uh, you can see that in front of a thiosulfate is two, and the front of iodine is one. Now, the iodine is the oxidizing agent. So NOA is one, while the thiosulfate is the reducing agent. NRA is two, as the case might be. I wish that I can go on and on and on and on. I have an example here. As you can see, that is an acid-based titration. And it says A is a solution containing 6.2 grams of an H2Y per gm cube, while B is containing 3.90 of sodium hydroxide per gm cube of solution. The instruction says put A into the burette and titrate it against 20 or 25 centimeter cube of B, portion of B, using methyl orange as an indicator. Repeat the titration to obtain consistent title. Remember your concordant values? Here it is. Tabulate your burette reading and calculate the average volume of A used. The equation for the reaction involved in the titration is H2Y plus two sodium hydroxide reacting to give you N2Y plus two moles of water. Obviously, the uh, atomic mass of hydrogen is one, 
atomic mass of oxygen is 16 and atomic mass of sodium is 23. The B part of the question says, from your result and the information provided, calculate the concentration of B in moles per dm cube. That the next one is calculate the concentration of A in moles per dm cube. And finally, calculate the molar mass of H2Y. Now, as we proceed, you find out that because that uh, the concentration, or if you look at the question, you find out that all the concentrations are mass concentration. You can see 6.22 grams of acid H2Y per dm cube. That's mass concentration. Then the other one is 3.90 grams of sodium hydroxide per dm cube of solution. So in some cases, these concentrations are not given in dm cube. They're given is 500 centimeter cube, 200 centimeter cube. And that's when you use uh, the mass over volume times 1,000 to convert it to dm cube. Now, I know you know how to use this formula. Now, to get your concentration of B per mole per dm cube, you use the formula mole per dm cube is concentration in gram per dm cube all over molar mass, if you have made molar mass subject of the formula. Molar mass of sodium hydroxide, you can see there, 23 plus 16 plus one to give you four grams per mole. So if you substitute um, your mass concentration over the molar concentration, you can get your concentration of uh, your B in mole per dm cube. Now, if you apply, once you know the concentration of one, either the acid or the base, now you get your VA, which is your average volume of AU. If you look at your table, we need to calculate the average volume of AU. That's your VA. Then what about your CB? That's what you have gotten as 0.0975 mole per dm cube. Then what about your VB? Remember I said is the volume of your pipette. And you are asked to calculate your CB, which is the concentration of Bs, or CA, the concentration of A. Uh, you can make your manipulation and you can arrive Answer. As you can see here, we substituted our CA to be equals to CB multiplied by VB multiplied by the mole ratio of A all over the volume of B times the mole ratio of B. Now, if you look at it, you get the manipulation, you arrive at your answer to be 0 0.0483 moles per dm cube. Now, if you continue in that regard, you find out that you are going to arrive at your final answer even if you have used uh, another table from the table I presented earlier on. You can see that your values are not the same with the tables I presented earlier on. So my wonderful student, I've come to the end of today's lesson. I'm sure you enjoy listening to it. I'm sure you're gonna learn from it. I'm sure it will aid you in your preparation for your exams. In case you have any questions, you can always reach me on my phone number. Uh, here you have a quite question, a number of questions that you can actually practice. It says, outline five precautions taken during acid-base diffusion. Number two, define the following terms. A, endpoint. B, indicator. C, standard solution. Number three, state the difference between endpoint and equivalent point. B, uh, strong acid and concentrated acid. And the last one is a calculation. It says, A contains 1.6 grams of trioxonitrate 5 acid. HNO3 in 250 centimeter cube of solution. And B contains 9.0 grams per dm cube of XHCO3. And uh, say 25 centimeter cube portion of B requires an average of 24.9 centimeter cube of A for complete neutralization. Calculate one, concentration of acid in mole per dm cube. Two, concentration of base in mode, uh, of HN. Uh, XHCO3 in mole per dm cube. And number three says molar mass of XHCO3 and find the value of X. The equation of the reaction is written below. I'm sure you will attempt these questions and I'm sure you will do well in your examination. Please practice. Also take a look at your redox titration, especially for those that are writing your SSC this year. The experiment is going to be on redox reaction. When you have issues, you can always reach me on my contact. My number is 08026-598861. Mr. Philip Maman again, 08026-598861. Uh, my wonderful students, I'm sure you did enjoy your lesson. I'm sure you have followed a number of my series. You can always get any topic you'd want to on my YouTube channel.
Go to YouTube and look for Philip Maman. You see my chemistry lessons, and I'm sure you will subscribe on YouTube, and we have a swell time discussing chemistry together. I hope I'll have time to also discuss qualitative analysis, where you'll be testing for quality. Do have a swell time, study your book, work hard, come up with flying colors, and achieve your dream. Have a nice day.